just before I begin, I want to take this moment to acknowledge that the conversation we're going to have is not just a theoretical conversation. This is a real issue for many of us Black people and one that deeply impacts our lives and our humanity and our dignity. And as we have this conversation, I ask you all to keep that in mind. The civil rights veteran Angela Davis has said recently that in America, this particular historical conjuncture holds possibilities for change that we have never before experienced. She thinks this could be a watershed moment for the US. Could it be a watershed moment for the UK? Intelligence Squared has brought together an incredible panel to discuss this tonight. With us, we have David Olushoga, the award-winning historian, writer, and broadcaster, and the author of Black and British, A Forgotten History. He's also the presenter of the BBC TV series, A House Through Time. I'm also delighted to welcome Dawn Butler, the Labour MP for Brent Central, and previously Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities in Jeremy Corbyn's Shadow Cabinet. And also joining us from Berlin, Susan Neiman, American moral philosopher and author of Learning from the Germans, Confronting Race and the Memory of Evil. And she explores how a country can come to terms with its racist history. She's also the director of the Einstein Forum and formerly professor of philosophy at Yale University and Tel Aviv University. So David, I'm going to start with you. You're speaking to us from Bristol and supported the protesters taking down Edward Colston's statue. What did that moment mean for the people of Bristol? I mean, taking it down or adding a plaque has been a conversation for years. Why has it taken us so long? Well, I think it meant different things for different people in Bristol. But I think there's two Bristols. And for half the city, it was an incredible moment. It was a moment in which something that was an embarrassment to the city, something that we were as ashamed to show visitors who came to visit us, that our city for 125 years had lauded and memorialised a mass murderer. But for many people in the city who I think have wrongly convinced themselves that Colston represents their history, and cared about people like them, then I think it's been um, a sort of traumatic moment. And the, the challenge now is to find a way, because something has happened, something decisive has happened, years of negotiation and petitions and appeals, things I've been involved in, had got nowhere. Well, you know, the thing about action is it's pretty decisive. Something has happened. We can't go back to the world of, of this time last week. The challenge now is to have a discussion. And I think one of the I'm very pleased to see, personally, Colston's statue coming down, but I would have been much happier to have seen it brought down to the official channels. But the question is now, is how do we who want to have a bigger conversation, the one Angela Davis talked about in the quote that you just mentioned, how do we prevent the statue's conversation becoming dominant in that? Statues are part of that. But if we just talk about statues and not this, the opportunities of this moment, which is to talk about race, then I think we will have been diverted. And I think there's a, in the British press, there's a comfort of talking about statues. And I've been asked to be taking lots of debates. And it's like people have got the playbook out from 2018, the last time this issue blew up. But things have changed. It's not 2018. The it, bigger things are happening, bigger ideas, bigger discussions. We mustn't let them drag us back away from this moment to a familiar debate of 2018. And I, I think that's a very important point, David. And although we will be talking about statues just for a little bit, the more pertinent part of this conversation is, is what it says about, as you say, race and, and, and history. And before I continue, I just want to say we have, over, we have about 1,500 people in the audience. So thank you all who have joined us from across the world. Um, and please do ask questions if you have. Susan, I want to come to you. What do you what do you think removing statues says? Like, I mean, what happened to the Nazi statues in Germany? Is it about erasing history, or is it about something else? So, um, before I answer that question, let me just say that I'm I'm always puzzled by the claim that statues are history. We don't memorialize every piece of history. Um, we memorialize things that we want to value, and that we want our children to walk by and say this person uh, embodied the values that I care about. So, uh, you know, statues are about values. They're not about history. And, and I, I wanted to add, when you said, Yasmin, um, people should remember this is a real issue for black people. There are an awful lot of white people for whom this is a real issue too. And it's a different kind of issue. I don't want to deny that. But I don't see it as a question of black history opposed to white history. 
but of truth rather than lies and of justice rather than injustice. And, uh, you know, that's why I and my kids um, have been, you know, and but many, many other people, you see them across the world, um, have been engaged in this moment. Um, as far as the question about Nazi statues, um, so uh, they were forbidden by the Allies. There are a couple left, in, but they're in very out-of-the-way places. Um, I actually thought that there were none, but, you know, people corrected me. But they're, you know, in little towns where nobody took them down. Uh, what you have instead is an incredible number of statues and memorials to, in different ways, to the victims of Nazi terror, to people who were in the resistance. I mean, um, my, my favorite example, which I think uh, it has gone into different countries than it could be even broader, are these things called stumbling stones. They're about that large. And uh, they're brass plaques that are put in front of buildings which were the last known address of people who were murdered by the Nazis. And, you know, I'm going to jump in there because I saw David had his hand up and then we're going to come to Dawn because I saw you nodding as well. David, go ahead. I, I was actually scratching my nose, but I'm quite happy to, oh, to see no, the no, that's right. fine. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but if, I, well, I think what's interesting about what, what Susan says is I, I, I recognize that entirely and I'm, I'm immensely impressed by Germany's capacity to do that. But when it comes to memories of the German colonial empire, I think you have a situation much more like the situation we have in Britain. The Germany's willingness to confront this in its memorial landscape, it begins in 1933 and it ends in 1945. The crimes committed by the, the, the age of the Kaisers in Namibia, in, uh, in what's now Tanzania, those monuments are still up. There are monuments to Why? generals who administered concentration camps. There are monuments to the First World War in Africa. There are monuments to to men who uh, were responsible for, I mean, Germany's first genocide in Namibia. Now, those statues are still up, so it is selective. No, it's let me, let me say this just uh, to try and encapsulate it. It took Germany a very long time to come to the point uh, where it stopped thinking of itself as the worst victim of the war and began to take some responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people tend to think, oh, my God, the German crimes were so horrible. They must have gotten on their knees the minute the war was over and begged for atonement. They resisted it very, very strongly, especially in West Germany. But we are having that debate about colonialism right now in this country. It's a big debate. And, you know, it's kind of one step at a time. I think I, I'm not suggesting that people go slow, in Nina Simone's words, but I am suggesting that we acknowledge um, to move from thinking of yourself as a hero to thinking of yourself as a victim to thinking of yourself as a perpetrator is something that actually nobody wants to do. And it's hard. And do you think, Dawn, do you think that's partly why this is so divisive in the UK. I mean, the Daily Mail recently equated the pros and cons of Colston, equating the con of slavery with the pro of him helping to build the West India docks. Why, why is this such an emotive issue for people? And why are folks so desperate to find reasons to either defend Colston or excuse slavery? Well, I mean, I don't think I would consider the Daily Mail to be a good source of information, to be honest. Um, in anyone's books, but I think it is becoming quite divisive and we cannot allow it to become a black and white issue. And I use that term deliberately because it is about history, as Susan and David has said. And there's lots of people now that are exploring that history. And when I was having this discussion with um, a conservative MP, he almost tried to talk about the pros and cons of uh, Edward Colston. And I said, but you've got, your own government has got a modern day anti-slavery bill. So you are not in favor of slavery. So therefore you should not be trying to argue uh, any form of slavery was right at that time because it was never right. And so we shouldn't really get into that debate or that argument. And I, and I think that if we stick to the historical context of everything, if we 
then talk about how we move forward. Who are the gatekeepers who are making these decisions? Let's stick to those factual things and then everybody can embrace it as a truth rather than uh, one side or another. And that's where I think the debate needs to go to. We know that having watched the, um, the brutal lynching of George Floyd, that whatever came next was going to be uncomfortable. And so we have to just appreciate that in the next steps of where we are will be uncomfortable for everybody and we need to accept that, embrace it, and then move forward. And Dawn, I'm going to build on that because folks like Angela Davis have spoken of this as a real moment. And some are saying that this is a moment for the United States. The UK has had many opportunities for a watershed moment from Stephen Lawrence, the uprisings in 2011, Grenfell, Windrush, even COVID-19. What is this moment any different? I think the reason why this moment feels different is because the whole world was on lockdown. So we were actually focused on different things. Our whole lives have been already interrupted by COVID-19. So all the new normalities of going to work, being in your car, going out for a drink for your friends, you know, going out for dinner, all of that stopped. And so we were all focused very differently. Our lives changed. And then all of a sudden, in front of our eyes, we watched the slow and brutal lynching of a black man by a white police officer. And it was very, very difficult for anybody to explain that away. Because normally, when a racist incident happens, there's always somebody in the background explaining it. Well, maybe they had a knife, or maybe they had a gun, well, maybe. There was no maybe, because when the camera then turned to the other, the other direction of, of the killing, there was three other officers stood on him. So there was no other maybe. So it was very difficult to explain this racism away. And that's why I think this moment is so different. And the fact that there's so many people taken to the streets, it's not just the black fight. When I was, you know, marching and you know, with my brothers, it was just mainly black people on the streets. Now it's everybody, all age groups, all coming together. The people that rolled Colston down the road, I don't think I saw a black person rolling him down the road. And I'm very grateful to people using their white privilege to do that because they probably won't get charged. So, you know, I don't think I saw a black person rolling him down the road. And I think that's vital and important as a vision to what we want society to be going forward. David, do you think that real change is possible without violence? So, and I ask this because even peaceful process, even the peaceful process of groups like the suffragists needed the direction, the direct action, sorry, of the suffragettes for some women to get the vote. And so, there, are, there are folks that are pushing back against the current movement saying direct action is not the best way, but should, re should revolution be by any means necessary? I think only if you're willing to go through with it. And what frightens me sometimes about people on the left, people who I agree with, is people who sit in academic conferences and talk about revolution and don't think about the consequences. They're very often people who do philosophy or, or, or literature. I've read history my whole life and it makes me terrified. I think the past, is a great, you know, in this country, and this is one of the problems we have with statues, we see history as a sort of place you go for recreation. I read history books and I'm terrified. I have a child, I worry about the future. And when I see people on the left talking about revolution, I think about the militias in America who have the same agenda, who have the same language, and they're in the fields with M16s. They're practicing and they're preparing. I think it's extremely dangerous. We are living in the midst of a pandemic that may well be with us for years. We are in the middle of the biggest recession since the Great Depression. 40 million Americans are unemployed. We have a media that had failed us even before this terrible moment of crisis. We have forms of communication and manipulation with internet and social media, with the algorithms and their manipulation that we have never known before. We still don't fully understand their capacity to hollow out and undermine democracies and civil, uh, civil society. The dangers of that moment are astonishing and profound and sobering. So 
I'm not going to talk about about revolution, and I don't want to talk about violence because I think if you honestly look into that, look into that world, think about what that would be like. It's it's a terrifying vision. We need to have conversations. This is why I say in Bristol, the next thing, and the onus I think is on people like me who were happy to see that statue toppled, is to try to explain to people why we felt that way, why the statue was put up, who Colston really was and try to bring round the people who feel that they have been attacked by us attacking the 17th century slave trader and try to convince them. Because the, to talk about revolution at this moment with the fissures of history breaking apart, I think is, personally, I think it's irresponsible. And I think people who are doing it need to go and you know read more about the 20th century and tell me you want a revolution. I see Susan nodding. Yeah, I'm nodding because I, I share David's worries. Uh, I am a philosopher, but I actually spend a lot of time reading history. And I also read a lot of contemporary news about what's going on in America. And the worry is that we've been talking about a cold uh, civil war since Trump uh, came to office. Uh, if it turns into a hot one, it's the right that has the weapons. So. Um, I am concerned about this, but I want to go back to something that Dawn said. I really think that the pandemic has put us in an extraordinary moment. And I, it's not in my business to make prophecies. I know people, there are people who want to say it's going to go this way or that way. Um, let me just remind you that the Great Depression in the 20s and 30s led in uh Germany to the triumph of fascism, but it led in the U.S. to the closest thing to a social democratic government we ever had. So it, it's in our hands. It could go either way. And I think that one of the things that's driving people as you know people come out of the streets and as it goes across the world is the thing that things we thought were entirely impossible before the pandemic turn out to be possible. People who wanted us to fly less were being told, oh yeah, right, sure, they're going to stop their easy jets and uh, planes are grounded, you know? I mean, both for good and bad, things that we thought were impossible suddenly happened. Um, we were told there's no money for social programs, you know, you leftists are crazy. And suddenly they came up with trillions of dollars. Um, you know, Not so, magic money tree, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that there's... We're, we're in a moment of extraordinary possibility that might, just might, produce real change without the kind of violence that David is rightly afraid of. Dawn, I'm going to come to you on that because um, I know I could see that you want to add something. And I'm also going to add an additional question to it, which is mm. this movement is under the banner of Black Lives Matter. But mm -hmm. it's not under the banner of BAME, which is Black, Asian, and Minority Ethnic, or people of color, or POC, but because Black people do suffer a specific type of oppression, an intersection of oppressions. But here in the UK, folks prefer to use BAME and POC, and especially in government. Why do you, why do you think Brit British people struggle so much in naming, in, in using the word Black or using or use the term BAME? Are they, what, what's going on there? Um, well, I, I never use that term. Um, BAME, because I think it's, I think it's a mistake to try and group everybody together. It means that if you are looking at measuring and monitoring, it makes it very difficult to do that. But also you wouldn't really refer to somebody, well, I wouldn't, as being BAME. So I would never, I don't ever use that term. You'll never hear me use that term, I'm, I'm much more comfortable with Black or African Caribbean. And so that is that is how I would um, describe myself. But I, but I understand that initially it came from a good place. It didn't come from a bad place. It came from a place of people wanting to be inclusive. And so that was a term that they found that they were able to use and feel comfortable with. And sometimes uh, people go on a journey and, you know, you have to <coughs> move with them on that journey. But it isn't a term that I would personally use. Um, and, and people get confused, you know, because when you talk about specifics around black men being stopped and searched, for instance, you know, they're 10 times more likely. It's very different for black men than it is for Muslim men, even though the figures are very similar. So, you know, we do have to break that down and contextualize it. 
Um, and then just picking up on something that David said just uh, in the modern context now, I am worried about um, I am worried about the growth of violence. We have the largest growth of the far right currently, and what you're seeing now is people sort of coalescing around, you know, his historical figures that they know nothing about, but they feel that something's being taken from them. And that is part of their recruitment strategy and their recruitment tool to say you are being emasculated or black people are taken over or, you know, we're no longer going to exist. And so, you know, I do think there is room there for that, or it's not even room, there is a vital component of us being honest about history and stop deflecting and distracting. Because what I'm finding is there's lots of deflection going on. As soon as you bring it up, especially uh, in the political sphere, as soon as you bring it, bring it up, all of a sudden there's a deflection into something else. And you're like, well, no, we have to, we have to deal with this now. Otherwise, we are not going to dismantle any of the structural or systemic racism that exists. And it means that the next generation will have to deal with this again. Um, and I don't want that to happen. Yeah, let's come to you, David, on that. I mean, taking Dawn's point around the deflection, um, slavery seems to be a forgotten part of British history. I mean, the Brits tend to think of it as an American story. Um, wh why is that? Well, before I answer that, can I just uh, say to, to Susan, I, I, I'm not suggesting historians are uh, rationally pessimistic and uh, philosophers aren't. I actually blame philosophy for making a pessimist by exposing me to Thomas Hobbes at uh, too young an age. So it's philosophy that uh, is, is the root cause of my, of my, my, my lifelong pessimism. I'm, I'm no one to defend traditional philosophy, not to worry. <laughs> but on, 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 the issue, on the issue of slavery, um, in 1807, Britain, the British Empire, abolished the slave trade. In the, in the 1830s, slavery was abolished. And then uh, in 38, enslaved people were released. And that was the sort of starting gun of a moment of, uh, of moral um, self-attribution fallacy. Britain used that moment. And it's not to say that both of those things were not remarkable. And it's not to say that both of those things were in some ways economically against British interest. I don't fully buy the argument that slavery had, had, had run its course by the 1830s. I think there's an argument for certain parts of the Caribbean that was the case, but certainly not places like Guyana. Britain did do something remarkable in the 1830s ending slavery. But what followed was this, this, um, this sort of orgy of self-satisfaction. And Britain used the abolition of slavery, particularly to look at America and feel better than America. Mm. But in that process mm. was forgotten the fact that the enslaved people in America from the 1840s and the sort of boom in, in cotton production, that the cotton was going to Liverpool and it was then being distributed around the 4,000 mills of Lancashire to produce what was Britain's number one export in the Industrial Revolution. In some cases, in some arguably the key commodity of the Industrial Revolution, which is cotton yarn and cotton clothing. The economists in the 1860s at the eve of the Civil War estimated one in five people in Britain was economically dependent to a certain extent of the, from the cotton trade or from the ancillary trades around it. Now, I was brought up in the northeast of, of, of England, and I was taught about the industrial, industrial revolution as my history. And it is. It's the history of the white working class half of my family. And I was told every detail of the Industrial Revolution and what, probably what you were taught at school about spinning jennies and water frames and these great men and Arkwright and the rest of them. Nobody at any point in my entire education told me where the cotton was coming from. Mm. told me that 1.8 million African-Americans, half the African-Americans enslaved on the eve of the Civil War, that almost all of what they produced went to Britain. So if you look at it very selectively and very myopically, if you edit out of your knowledge and your vision certain realities, then you can look down on America and you can conclude that Britain is a superior, is a superior, a morally superior nation. If you forget that Britain was importing sugar from produced in Brazil until the 1880s, if you forget that, that, that Britain was involved in forms of slavery in the Pacific and Australia at the same time, then if you, if you, if you're willing to be that myopic, then you can decide Britain is a, is a morally superior nation. And as a result of doing that, if you ask someone to describe slavery, this might be less true now than it was, say, 10, 15 years ago, what they tend to describe are fields of cotton, 
of large white houses at the end of avenues of trees and a guy who looks like the sort of Kentucky fried chicken bloke. That's American slavery, cotton slavery from the, the, the high point of, uh, of, of the cotton economy. Not British, not Jamaican, proto-industrial sugar slavery, the thing that built the city I'm, I'm sitting in now. And that, I mean, that selective amnesia means that one could argue the British lost the empire and kept the myth. And But I want to come to you, Susan. And can I just also say there are over 16 hundred people in the audience and over a hundred questions already. So we're going to try to get through as many as possible. Thank you so much. Keep those questions coming. But Susan, something I found really interesting in your book is how you write about Germans feeling a sense of shame around their their history, particularly um, their recent history in the, in the 20th century and the condemnation now of anti-Semitism as something that was you described as swift, sharp and serious. Do you think that that is required by governments and societies in confronting racist histories? So, no, wait. You may have read my book more recently than I have. Swift, sharp, and, and, and furious is oh, not... Oh, furious. Sorry, not serious. furious. Yeah, but it's not. Uh, it's certainly not a way to describe, say, the first 50 years after the end of the war. On the contrary, they were very slow about it. Um, they are not slow anymore. They are, however, much slower to condemn uh, racism in general. I mean, they're working on it. It's happening. Um, but they're kind of allergic to anything that sounds anti-Semitic, whereas they're still working to you know, extend that to people of color. There's no question about that. Um, shame. So. The first generation that kind of came of age, uh, say in the 60s, and realized that their parents and teachers, if not Nazis, um, you know, had done nothing to stop them, with very, very few exceptions. They were ashamed of their parents. They were ashamed of the nation. They tried to pretend they were Dutch or J Danish if they traveled in Europe. I mean, and there was a, there was a revulsion towards all of German culture. Um, in, in that generation. Um, it's, it's an interesting, uh, I think there's now a fairly healthy development. Uh, we have a very good president, not um, Angela Merkel, who's the chancellor, but our president Steinmeier um, has been very good about saying most recently, he said, you can only love this country with a broken heart. And, you know, saying we, we absolutely cannot um, ever fail to acknowledge uh, the Nazi crimes, but we do need to look at points of light in our history. And I think that's something that every nation needs to do. Shame is something that I, I had a conversation with one of my heroes, Brian Stevenson. I don't know if you've read his wonderful book, Just Mercy. If you haven't, uh, you should. He's the founder of both the Equal Justice Initiative that gets people off of death row, and of the wonderful National Lynching Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama, which is worth a trip to Montgomery, Alabama, I'm telling you. Um, but I, I interviewed him because he said he was very influenced. He's the only uh, you know, American I knew who was saying this. He was influenced in his construction of the memorial by what he had seen in Germany, particularly the stumbling stones, particularly the, um, the effort not just to make gorgeous, awe-inspiring memorials in a particular place, but to bring the knowledge out into the streets to change the landscape of the country so that people will remember, here, a man was lynched. This mm -hmm. house was built with slave labor. Mm -hmm. This is the middle mm -hmm. of what you're doing. And he talked about how shame is for real change. Mm -hmm. um, so Dawn, I'm going to come to you on this. Thank you, Susan, because... I mean, is that is that what the government needs to do? What do you think the government should do to make amends? Is it simply apologizing? Is it reparations? Is it changing the landscape? Oh, there's there's so much that needs to be done. I mean, yeah. in regards to reparations, don't forget we received a tweet. Um, David will know the date. Okay, with the moment in 2015 that basically said, "Congratulations, we've now finished paying all of the slave owners." Uh, you know, congratulations, this is your fun Friday fact or something, which it, it was just shocking. I think it was 
40 percent of you know of the uh, of the country's uh, budget went to paying the slave owners so there's a whole conversation to be had around reparations but i think the first thing there's loads of things but one of the things has to be history i think we need to be teaching history in its truest forms in school from the very beginning. We need to set up a, an emancipation museum. It could be another name if you like. I mean, I am not that uh, I am not that fond of having monuments and statues, to be honest. I'd rather the money be spent on, uh, on, a, on a museum and history and something that's going to educate uh, people. I'd rather the money be spent there. Um, there's practical things like looking at the ethnicity pay gap. What can we what can be done about that? This is how we start breaking down the structural barriers, you know, making sure the Equality and Human Rights Commission is independent. You know, we have to tackle uh, the disproportionate amount of uh, young black and brown people in prison. We have to tackle the judicial system. I was a magistrate. I can tell you, you know, how it plays out in reality, where you're fighting to say that, you know, you have a bias when you are judging this person because you are judging them all to be the same and not seeing the individual case. There is so much we have to do to dismantle all the structural and systemic racism. I mean, you mentioned Stephen Lawrence uh, earlier, Yasmin, and uh, that was a, a clear case of where the structural racism existed, where because the murderers were protected because they were in a particular group. And if it wasn't for the fact that the Lawrences had a clean record, we, we, we may never have got, you know, to the truth of that. And obviously, a Labour government getting in and, uh, and ordering uh, the review, but we would never have got to the truth of that. And so there's so much that needs to be done and can be done and should be done. And, and just one thing, most recently, we mentioned COVID-19. We've got the Public Health England report. So a whole section of that report was removed and, and, and the government said it didn't exist. And we know it exists. And we're thinking, this is crazy. You know, you cannot continue to do this. And so there's so much that can and needs to be done. One of the things actually in the US that activists are pushing for is this idea of defunding the police, which means divesting money from local police budgets and reinvesting it into local communities, mental health and social service programs. I mean, does that, does that have an equivalent here in the UK? No, you have a crazy way of funding your police force in America. I mean, I'm just beginning to learn how it's all been funded and how much money uh, the police force gets. And I've seen how much overtime they've been getting as well during, uh, uh, during the riots. It's just absolutely crazy. I mean, there's too much money um, in the police force and that needs to be removed. But we don't really have that equivalent uh, here um, in the UK, no. David... I'm going to come to you on the concept of education. Um, you talk a lot about, uh, or you have talked about the education system. What does it mean when people talk about the black curriculum and what would that look like here in here in the UK? Before I answer that, can I, I'm very struck by something that, that Susan said. Those, mm. those conversations that happened at a national level, but also critically at a family level in Germany when the generation who had been children during the war... Those confrontations, they were, I mean, there are some wonderful accounts of them. They were over the kitchen table. They were dramatic, powerful confrontations in which people sat down with their parents and go, what did you do or what didn't you do? I was talking to uh, a, a British public figure, somebody quite famous who I won't name, and they were describing this gulf between their parents and their children this is taking place over three generations, that their children could not and would not spend time with or relate or talk to the grandparents because the grandparents had been involved at a very high level in the British Empire. And it reminded me so much of the conversations that Germany is a better place because they took place between generations. And to understand this moment, I think it really is about generations. Look at the ages of the people who took part in the demonstration and the toppling of Colston in Bristol. They, they were young. Now, compare that to the last mass demonstration that we had in Britain, which were the Brexit demonstrations. Now, I'm afraid that, that was people of my age. That was my generation who feel aggrieved by uh, the loss of our, pla our place in Europe. Now, 
partly because this is a generation, this, the, the issue of race matters more to younger people, but also partly because we're at home, because we're vulnerable and old. Uh, we've cleared the space for young people to fight for their issues. And it is quite amazing how old the demonstrations in Britain had got uh, because, of, because of Brexit. Youth, generational change is fundamental to, to this moment. And the reason that young people, and I think this is black, white, brown, this is where the, maybe the word baby is, can, be, can be useful. The reason this is multi-generation is because that generation, despite what they haven't been taught at school, have worked out that there are gaps in their education. They've worked out that they've been told partial histories and untruths. And in some ways, my life is a sort of a, is a focus group where I discover this because I'm on television talking about these histories and I'm stopped constantly by young people of all races. And they're, they're angry about what they haven't been taught at school. They know their curriculum is partial. They watch programs like mine. They read books by Akala and Afua Hirsch and Rennie Addo Lodge and they fill in the gaps and they're pissed off. They know that they're, 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 they're being lied to. And that's why they led the demonstration. And that's why something very important happened in Bristol. If this was, as the right-wing press said, thuggery, why is every shop in central Bristol, and I know those streets really well, why do they have their windows still in today? Why was there no damage to anything else? Why did they target a single bronze statue in a city where they could have, there's a shop full of trainers 200 metres up the road? Why was it Colston? Because these, these kids are educated and they're angry and they're right to be. Dawn, I see you nodding quite a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I remember um, my parents are Jamaican and I remember there was a time when they stopped going to Jamaica because it was too dangerous for them to go to Jamaica. And then I think I must be 18 or 19 and I decided to take myself to Jamaica and, and, you know, and they threatened for the whole time. They were worried. And I had the most amazing time. And I came back angry because I said, you've allowed, you've allowed a really negative narrative to take over from your memories of a really beautiful country. Yes, there's pockets, but there's pockets everywhere. But to, you know, to paint Jamaica in such a negative uh, framework. I was really angry, and I, I, you know, I started going back to Jamaica every year after that. And so I think, you know, once you learn something that, and you've been told something else, and you learn that it's not exactly the whole truth, you are filled with all of this emotion that just takes over, and then you overcompensate sometimes. And I think that's why you find, you know, lots of young people on the streets campaigning and protesting. Sure. We're almost at time to turn to questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address one last question. Um, Susan, I'll start with you for this. You've said that Britain is even further behind on educating itself than the US. What do you think a national reckoning in Britain looks like? So first of all, I mean, I just have to agree with what both David and Dawn have said. I think um, Britons are even less aware of, although... David's talking about the next generation. I do think there's a breakthrough there. But they're even less aware of the horrible parts of their history than Americans are. And you know, everything David said about the outsourcing of slavery to the colonies is absolutely right. Um, so in a way, the British colonialism was double evil. First, it was bad for the places that they colonialized, and it also allowed... Um, people to put slavery as somebody else's problem. And of course, um, as we know, um, it was often much more brutal in the Caribbean than it even was in the American South. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, you know, I, I you asked Dawn about a number of programs. I mean, what one can learn from the German experience is that there isn't one thing that's going to do it. Um, all of these things are pieces of public education, public memory. I mean, I un, like Don, I understand the worries about appropriating funds, but I actually think changing the shape, the landscape of a city is important. And I think there are ways to do it without spending vast amounts of money on bronze or gold or whatever, you know? Um, so, but all of those things, taking reparations uh, seriously is a travesty. I read that piece too, in fact, I, in my book that um, 
you just finished paying off the slaveholders and no one has discussed paying off the enslaved people or their descendants, it's, it's, it blows the mind, you know? So that needs to be an object of discussion. I know there's a discussion about black history or black curriculum. I am always slightly nervous about black studies programs and about women's studies programs because I worry about re-ghettoization. We have enough examples of you know, great writers of color, great women writers, at you know, and and pieces of history that's our history that need to be incorporated into a general curriculum because it's not something that's simply important for Black people to to know. It's important for all of us to consider our history. So, um, yeah, so in yeah, I think making perhaps the idea of Black history being part of the history yes. is what you're pointing yeah. to there. Yeah. yeah. Point. And black literature being part of literature, not being, you know, taken off into a black history month the way it is in America or black right. studies or post-colonial studies where a very small number can can, you know, really pay attention to them. That needs to be part of the history that everyone learns. So, Absolutely. David, it sounded like there was optimism there for you around the young people and the next generation coming up. I mean, the UK has, Britain never has, has not had a civil rights movement in the same way that the US has. Do you think that Britain needs a civil rights movement? And is it the young people, the next generation that are gonna take that up or what does that look like? I'm not sure whether the American model of the civil rights movement is the template we should apply to British history. And I think we often, we often do a strange thing. We compare ourselves to America because we have a shared language. When the most pertinent, the more pertinent comparisons would be to compa compare ourselves with France or with the Netherlands, who have a colonial history much, much more like our own. And I think it's trying to cite the black experience in Britain within the wider colonial experience. And this is where, again, you know, I, I understand the problems with, with the name, the term Bain. But while there's specificity to the black experience, there's a shared colonial experience. Mm -hmm. And while the terms may be, may be clumsy, if I talk to, I have a friend who was brought up in the Northwest, he's Pakistani, um, and like me, he's literally carries the scars of the 1980s on his body. Like me, he did loads of martial arts, which is something you'll find a lot of um, black and Asian guys in my age, because there was a quite reason why we were playing, doing martial arts rather than playing football, because we were trying to fight to stop being hospitalized. And he describes football, the, 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 the home team playing in his town to me, and it's, it's exactly my experience. So we have an enormous shared experience there. But beyond that, we also have a deep shared experience of the force that impacted into our lives was the empire. Now, I'm Nigerian, so the world of the Atlantic slave trade affected Nigeria. Uh, I'm from a town called Ijeabode in, in, in Ogon State, and there are people from that town who are recorded as being enslaved, and there's people in the town who are slave traders. I have no idea what my background is, but what I do know is that the story that it's wrapped up in is the British Empire, and that's mm -hmm. the same as someone from Sri Lanka. It's the same as someone from the Caribbean. The imperial story, the imperial experience, is the big thing that all of us, black and white, can agree on, because that's the discussion we haven't been having. We know nothing about the empire, and it is hidden... Mm -hmm. It's hidden in plain sight. It's in our language, it's in our cuisine, it's in our culture, it's in our place names, it's in almost every aspect of our lives, and we don't even recognize it. And mm -hmm. it allows us to do this, this odd sort of form of schizophrenia. We boast that we are, were the, the nation that had the greatest empire the world has ever seen, on which the sun never set, and yet we see ourselves as this terribly fragile victim of people who want to make us feel guilty. And it is this odd saber-rattling posture and confidence, and then this incredible vulnerability whenever the, the subject is, is, is raised, the urge is dawn set to deflect it. That's a, a, that is a sort of, it's almost like a sort of a bipolar attitude towards mm. our history. Thank you, David. I, so we have over 200 questions, so I'm gonna jump right into questions. Um, but wow. firstly, let me thank you all for, we got through so much there. Um, and Dawn, I'm gonna direct the first question to you, and it's from, Corinne, who says, with the Conservatives in power, there doesn't seem to be room for a real conversation about racism and how it permeates our society. When MPs are literally denying racism, 
and, and the policy and decision making rests with those in power, how can we hope for lasting change? I'm, I'm not going to lie. It is really, really hard because those people that are currently in position of power where they could do something about it, first of all, you know, we do have to get over that hurdle of them acknowledging that the problem exists without saying, but when they do acknowledge the problem exists, they say, well, we'll have a consultation or we'll get a Public Health England report, but we won't give you all the report. We'll hide the bits that actually will make the difference and dismantle some of the structural and systemic racism that exists. So what we have to do and continue to do is to highlight it, is to highlight it and break them down. We literally have to break them down. And it is hard, you know, when they when they put up and 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 also I I sometimes, you know, when I'm feeling quite generous, I will think about the journey that some of their MPs have gone through, you know, their black MPs um, or their Asian MPs just to survive in that space that they're in. So they've had to deny who they are or the struggle to just to survive in their space. So you've got all of all of that that you have to deal with before we can have, even get to the legislation. But there's so much to do. And I think what we're going to do next week, Thursday, um, I have a debate on the floor in the House on how COVID affects the BAME um, communities. And so we're going to start breaking down all of the stuff that this government is trying to hide. And I think when people see the truth, we don't even have to see it, you feel it because we're all living it at the moment, that we will slowly get that change. But it is very difficult and very frustrating. Um, Thanks yeah. for that honest, that honest answer. Um, I'm going to direct one question to you, David, and one question to you, Susan, just so that we can get through these. Um, so there's been a couple of questions around statues, and the broad, the broad ask is where do we draw the line? Do we go through the lives of every historical figure with, as the questioner asks, um, 20, the lens of 21st century racism criteria, um, and why just racism as opposed to gender discrimination and other types of bigotry? Um, and also somebody asking from a journalist from the Liverpool Echo saying, is there any place, monuments, statues in particular um, in Liverpool that should be removed or renamed? And then Susan, a question for you um, from Martin. Can I genuinely be ashamed of something I have not done? So yes, I can be ashamed of racist thoughts, but can I be ashamed on behalf of others who died centuries before I was born? Please, David. Uh on the issue of statues, I don't think race is the only criteria. Today, we've seen uh, a call to take down a statue of Baden-Powell for the reason that he supported. He was favourable towards uh, the Nazis, and he called Mein Kampf a wonderful book. I don't think this is entirely about race. And also, if it were about race, then that wouldn't it wouldn't be the case that the Roads Must Fall movement started in South Africa with Afrikaner. Uh, students at the University of Cape Town who remembered Rhodes as an oppressor of the Afrikaner. Remember the Jameson Road, the, the Jameson Raid. So this is not just about race. Lots of people, um, black and white, can have a problem with a figure like Cecil Rhodes because they've read what he actually did. Also, um, these, what is wrong with the idea of looking at who these people on pedestals are? Why is that such a strange idea that we want to know whether they are worthy of valoration, because statues aren't a mechanism for telling us history. They are a way of validating people. And are we, is it that unusual an idea? Is it that challenging an idea that we'd, we'd look to see whether these people are worthy of validation? And one of the most powerful myths in all of this is that people, that this idea of the 21st century lens, in his lifetime, Cecil Rhodes was a deeply controversial figure a profoundly disliked figure by millions of people. He was so disliked that the three founders of what is today Botswana, with their friends in the Missionary Society, worked out that they could keep their land out of Cecil Rhodes's uh, private empire by coming to Britain and appealing directly to the British population because they hated Cecil Rhodes so much. So three black guys could come to 1890s Britain, go on a press tour and win favour over and... and uh, be favoured by the government eventually over Cecil Rhodes. He was hated at the time. This, this, this idea that these people were entirely popular in their lifetime and only now as li liberal lefties hate them. Think about these people. Most of them are politicians now and then and all times. People didn't like their politicians. 
<laughs> you have to believe that everybody in the past always loved politicians, always loved the generals, always loved the ruling elite, always loved the lords and the the dukes and the viscounts on top of and on top of the pedestals. Read some British history; they were hated oh. at the time. Um, I'm just going to press you just on on the um, the point around Liverpool because a, a journalist from the Liverpool Echo is asking, you know, there's there's an ongoing debate about the origins of Penny Lane um, and whether it's connected to the slave trade. And um, Julia was wondering whether this came up in your research. I didn't. I used to live in Liverpool. I went to Liverpool University. I think the much more pertinent case is the Gladstones. The Gladstones are absolutely fundamental to the story uh, of Liverpool. And the Gladstones are the family, John Gladstone, the father of William Ewart Gladstone, the prime minister. The Gladstones received more compensation at the end of slavery than any single dynasty. And after after slavery, they were fundamental. They were key to inventing the Indian indentured labour system, which was the system of uh, of uh, labour that was used to replace slavery. So I think we need to think a lot about the Gladstone family and their role in the sto in the story of Liverpool. But I have to say, Liverpool, a city I love very much, a city I lived in for three years, and a city with a slavery museum. I'm sitting mm. in Bristol, a city I love very much, lived in for 22 years, I've yet to notice a slavery museum. Instead, we've had a statue of a slave trader on a pedestal for 125 years. So I think Liverpool's done comparatively well, but there's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. I think Glasgow's got a long way to go. I think London, I mean, the fact that um, we're only now having a public conversation about the West India docks, the reason we're having that conversation is because they've been camouflaged behind this phrase, Canary Wharf. Mm -hmm. It's the West India docks. It was the biggest private construction in British history when it was built. It was so expensive. An act of parliament had to be pushed through. And what it was, was the biggest facility in Europe for the reception from the ships of the Atlantic trade of sugar, a slave-produced commodity. That was a fundamental part of the infrastructure that relied on the bodies of 800,000 people. Thanks, David. I'm going to come to you, Susan. Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add a couple of things. First of all, to all the people who say, um, you know, are we going to judge them by the standards of today? I mean, first of all, as David rightly points out, a lot of them were highly controversial, including Winston Churchill in his day. Um, but, but secondly, what's wrong with the idea of progress? I mean, we actually have made some moral progress, you know? Mm -hmm. Questions about racism, slavery, mm -hmm. oppression of women, you know, uh, I, it's, it's, it's not a very trendy view, but I, I think it, you know, it ought to be acknowledged. The second thing is there are other things to do with statues besides throw them in the harbor. There's contextualization, for it, um, which is a really interesting way to go about things. And it needs to be done as a process of democratic debate, which itself will bring the history. So here's something like almost every American. Um, and, and I come from a family. My mother was in, involved in the civil rights movement in the South in the 60s. I had no idea when those Confederate statues were put up and what purpose they served until about five years ago when the debate over them began. And it turned out that it wasn't about my heritage and my father. It was a very conscious uh, part of the rewriting of history or the falsifying of history on the part of certain groups. And it kept returning the urge to do this. Every time the civil rights movement made a gain, you would suddenly get new statues coming up. Okay, So mm. I, an educated person, learned a lot of history in the last five years over these debates. And I'm sure that it could happen in, in Britain as well. What you might have to think about doing with Winston Churchill is the sort of thing that is now happening in the US over Thomas Jefferson, at least an equally beloved figure in American history. You know, he wrote the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, uh, all men are created equal, and he not only owned slaves, he fathered slaves who he did not free in his will. I mean, it's quite crazy. Uh, and he did himself say, to give him credit, towards the end of his life, I tremble for my country uh, when I think that God is just, because he thought that America would pay for slavery. So what they've done now, for example, at Monticello, which is the home he built, it's gorgeous. Um, they've also, they have archaeologists unearthing the slave quarters. And you can take two different tours, and hopefully most people take both of them, one from the perspective of Thomas Jefferson, 
and the other uh, from the perspective of the enslaved people. And one needs to think about creative ways to do that. I'm going to come to you, Dawn. And Susan, I might come back to you on the point of being ashamed for something um, historically, but somebody's asking a question around how you feel as an MP walking around Parliament and the artwork and imagery that is displayed in the palace part of the estate in particular, and whether you think there's room to move some of the artwork to a museum to make room for more art that is representative of the of the diversity of you know Parliament or Britain. Um, and I'm also going to add another, another question. A few folks have asked, um, should people from the Black and Asian and minority ethnic communities be looking to enter the justice system and so on um, as a way to to make change? Is that is that I mean, you yourself said that you worked in that space. Is that something that you think people should be considering? Um, so I, I take the easy one first. Um, yes, I think people should absolutely consider being part of the justice system. People should apply to be a magistrate. They shouldn't give up if they say no, because they said no to me the first time uh, I applied and uh, and made sure that I reapplied, because um, that is vital. Because until we get people in different positions in society, we are not going to get the change that we see. Our changes will be small, they'll be incremental, but they'll be small and tiny. So it's vital. I, I've, I stopped people going to prison just because I brought a different perspective to the debating room. So 100% people should um, should apply, should be part of um, school governors. We see a higher exclusion of black kids in schools, and we know about the, you know, the school to prison, the exclusion to prison pipeline. So we need people to be more active socially. Um, in regards to parliament, how do I feel? So let me first of all say that there, there is a commission in Parliament, where they're looking at different um, paintings and different works of art. And we recently saw Bernie Grant, a lovely um, picture of Bernie Grant was hung in Parliament in Portcullis House. So there's different bits of art being commissioned. Um, how do I feel? Um, I know we haven't got that much time, but when I first entered Parliament in 2005, there used to be a picture of Enoch Powell outside of my office. So every time I walked into my office every day, I would see Enoch Powell. So every time, every morning I walked into my office, I would give him the finger salute and, you know, and I would go into, into my office. And then I thought, I don't actually want to start my day every day doing that. I want to start my day with a different mindset. And so I asked for it to be removed. And um, they, they were iffy and butting. And then, you know, a couple of months later, and I said, look, it's really fine. If you don't remove the picture, I will. So it's your choice. Um, and then it was removed. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> Sometimes we just got to do it ourselves, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, John. I'm going to come to you, David. And there's been a couple of questions around this, which is um, folks, historians saying that statues should go into museums. Um, but somebody asking, and I'll see if I can find the question, how can we trust the museums when uh, they themselves are systemically racist. So Jennifer asks, how, how do you trust the museum to tell the story of Colston? Um, and somebody else was asking, you know, isn't part of the problem that the museums themselves looted? Um, and this is a time for examples like the British Museum to give back some of the things like the Elgin marbles or the Benin bronzes. I think that's exactly the reason why these statues would be great in museums, because it would reunite the looters with their stolen goods. Uh, it would be a sort of homecoming in some ways. They could almost almost a poignant moment. Um, I think. I think to be yeah. honest, I think that's enough. That 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 David, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> that is, um, I can give you a sensible answer as well. <laughs> um, well, we're, we're almost out of time, so I want to get through a few more questions. Um, and maybe I'll, I might ask you again to respond to this, and I might come to Susan as well. Um, the question is. Is acceptance and understanding of white privilege by white people essential for us to move forward? And this comes from uh, Philip Bushell. Bushell, sorry. Um, I might start with you, Susan, yeah. I'm a white person. Um, so look, um, yes, but it all depends on exactly what one does with and about it. Um, you know, and I guess this goes back to the shame question. Mm -hmm. I that one can feel shame 
for a nation in which one has has benefited from privilege for accidental facts about one's birth, okay? Um, so if that is a goad towards, uh, you know, actually changing things, I think that's okay. Um, so recognizing white privilege for me means, number one, recognizing, uh, you know, that there's stuff that I got that I didn't earn. Um, I hope it's also when somebody said, I, maybe it was Dawn, scientifically used their white privilege by going out on the streets and, and throwing the statues in so that they won't get, you know, they're, they're much less likely to be arrested. I actually, my daughter is organizing exactly something like this in the same <laughs> moment. Really? Um, I don't think it means being abject. I don't think it means um, you know, tearing one's hair out. I think it means fighting for universal justice, using that privilege in ways that it can be uh, can be useful to a fight. Um, but again, I'm I'm always wary of our tendency in this day and age on the left to see things in terms of tribes. Um, I'm, you know, again, it's it's about truth and not your truth versus my truth. It's about the truth of history. And um, yeah. Well, thanks, Susan. And one of the other questions, actually, speaking about the truth comes from Lucy and says, and I'm going to give this to you, John, in the light of the news that slave owners were hugely compensated over generations, should the descendants of the enslaved be exempt from paying taxes or perhaps paying for education? Are there other creative ways of addressing reparations? I like the idea of not having uh, to pay for taxes. Yeah, I know. I think lots of people will. But unfortunately, we do need taxes. Uh, sorry, to, sorry, to yes. <laughs> society. But, um, but um, I mean, I agree with Susan on the white privilege point as well. I think that was um, spot on. But I think there's things that needs to be done, right? There's... Um, apprenticeships that need to be done i, I mean i i did i i did a talk in the bank of england and they've got this big apprenticeship scheme and i said well actually it doesn't even matter uh, how much you give it's never going to be enough because you were built on the backs of slaves so you owe a lot more than you're ever going to give so and i think that's what history will do history history will highlight the debt owed and i think that's really important because People often say, you know, why Why do you want this or why do you want that? I mean, I don't personally want any money. I don't want a pot of money for my own reparations, but I want to ensure that we have some equity in society. Mm -hmm. And the way we're going to get equity in society is giving some people a bit more, and that is how it needs to work. I mean, it's really easy to be successful when you, don't, when you didn't have to pay for labour. You know, it's really easy to say, we built this. Well, you built that on the backs of enslaved labor. Actually, that's not something to be proud of. Mm. So I think the debate and the discussion needs to be had in those terms. But I'm afraid I can't endorse no pain of no taxes. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I may have pushed that a little far. <laughs> David, I'm... I'm going to come to you um, on the question of uh, from Shamisa. Do you think the telling of true African history is important as a means of decolonizing history education and essentially saying not having history, um, African history start from a place of slavery and colonization, but the many kingdoms and civilizations before European settlement? I think that's that's important. And, you know, I think history matters to people of African descent in a very specific way, because Africans were told they didn't have a history. The British went to India. They told the Indians that they were backward and, and, uh, and uncivilized, but they didn't say they didn't have a history because it was manifest and obvious and in their face. But they did say that to Africans. So I think it's really important. But I think there's something to me, and I probably would say this because my interest is imperialism. There's also about this is half a millennia of contact between Africa and Europe. And it didn't begin with slavery. It began with gold. It began with a big commodity because it was European concept, the, 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 the desire to get round Africa to get to the gold was about cutting out the middlemen of the Arab traders who carried it across, across the Mediterranean. It was about gold. It began about gold. It also began about ivory. Read about the, uh, the British expedition, the English expeditions, I should say, in the 1540s and 1550s, Tudor expedition to Africa. 
It's not about slavery. They bring Africans to Britain, but they bring them to teach them English, to send them back as translators so they can help them get more gold. We, we, if we see it just as slavery, then that's a problem. But I think there's one other thing is, and I understand what people say of this, and, I, and I, I'm cautious saying this because I'm Nigerian and not African-American or, or Caribbean, but when people say they feel ashamed when their ancestors are described as slaves, what I say to them is read about the lives of slaves. They were remarkable people. They survived a system designed to crush them and kill them and dehumanize them and commoditize them. And they came out of that, those who survived, those who escaped, people like Frederick Douglass, with their humanity intact, with their humanity on display and vivid and powerfully articulated. The idea, I, I think there's a real danger of seeing the word slave as, as, as a, a dehumanizing term even now, because they were some of the strongest people who've ever lived. Can, can I say, I mean, I, th I, I think that's why we should have like an emancipation uh, museum rather than a slavery museum, because, you know, there, there's so much, as you say, strength that we don't talk about. And so that's why I think we should focus on those kinds of words. I guess the worry I have, though, is all we focus on is abolition. Mm. We always focus on the last chapter yeah. of the story. Uh, and I, I, I mean, the big thing for me is we haven't got an empire museum. It's the biggest yeah. story yeah. in British history, how this little yeah. island off the coast of Europe yeah. took over a third of the world's land surface. Um, mm. That's the biggest story in British history. And we have museums to you know, almost every element of our history. But we haven't got a history to the biggest uh, museum, to the biggest... The biggest question, the biggest mystery, the biggest phenomenon in British yeah, history. Conversation that they don't want to have, right? Yeah. Well, there's actually it's, a question it's... around this. Sorry, so I'll come back to you in a second. Um, Farah Chowdhury asks, does the selective amnesia on British colonialism come from the shame of the decolonization of the British Empire? So maybe to your point, David, is the fact that there isn't an empire museum part of the shame of having lost the empire? Oh. Well, there was. I mean, the empire was not something that was uh, hidden away uh, when it, when it was when it was active. I mean, the the history of the empire is of grand durbas, of uh, jubilees, of uh, of the empire being sort of uh, you know proudly celebrated. The famous map on every every um, classroom. But the British sort of they had a sort of slightly disconnected story with the empire because even when the empire was active i don't think people fully understood and there's lots of reasons to believe this fully understood how much it changed their lives sugar was just in the shops the fact mm. that something had been a, a luxury in the 16th century and became one of the key sources of calories by the 19th century was something that people sort of forgot this infrastructure behind it tea was a birthright this incredible story of industrial espionage of taking this drink from china transplanting it to india getting a million indians to produce it that was sort of all hidden behind just this drink that became you know what's more british than a cup of tea think about the, the the names we have for tea, you know, English breakfast tea, builder's tea, Earl Grey, all of that tea is Chinese. Uh, most of it was, was, was from India. The most popular, well, one of the most popular brands in tea in this country is called Yorkshire Tea. They're not growing tea in Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've actually seen it. This is it. the way we disguised the empire. Even while it was happening, it was hidden in plain sight. It impacted everyone's life, every day. Everybody consumed something that was an imperial product. And yet you could somehow live this, this dual split mentality where you didn't think much about the empire, but it shaped your life. Last word to... Um... I'm really sorry. This I could have this conversation for hours. So thank you all so much. I'm going to give a last word to you, both Susan and Dawn. Susan, what I mean, you're t you you've written about the guilt and the shame um, that the Germans have had to work through. Any last thoughts on that? So um, there's a question. There there was a question I'm often asked. In fact, I was asked it when I presented the book last fall in London in a couple of television shows. Um, oh, we don't have anything to learn from the Germans. Hitler was about world domination. And fortunately, I was quick on my feet enough to say, I, I thought the sun never set on the British Empire. You know, what are you talking about? Uh, but this was a very new thought to um, both the presenters who were interviewing me. And, you know, you often get the claim 
um, Nazi crimes were worse than any other crimes in the world, and therefore nothing can be compared to them. It's somehow offensive to do that. Um, I do not think it is uh, trivializing those who died in the Holocaust to remember, first of all, that 14 million Slavic people were also brutally civilians brutally killed on the Western Front, that, you know, many, many people in other places have been uh, tortured and murdered. And, I mean, the entire point of remembering the Holocaust is not to say, well, never again should, German put, should Germans put Jews in uh, concentration camps, but let us learn and let us universalize the principle that no form of evil of this kind, and there are differences, there are similarities. We do not want to be party to any of these forms of evil. And thank you, Susan. Dawn, last words. Are you optimistic for the future? I think we have to be. Um, otherwise, sort of, what's the point? But I think the fact that we've seen uh, the younger generation come out and the fact that they are so inclusive and ready and hungry for change and to make society better. And then you've got the next generation and the next generation. Look at the people that have been arrested for, um, for the environment. You know, they are the grandparents who kids got them out on the street so they can afford to now get a criminal record. So the fact that you've got generations now of activism coming together, hopefully, um, I am optimistic that we will um, see change together, but it needs to be uh, systemic and lasting. So it means that we dismantle the structures on the way. We learn about history on the way, and we we move together with a with a common understanding of uh, what we need to not go back to and repeat history. So yes, I'm optimistic. Here's to systemic and lasting change. Thank you, David Alushoga, Susan Neiman, Dawn Butler. I'm going to pass back to Farah. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our whole panel and thank you, Yasmin, for being such a brilliant chair for this evening's event. If you'd like to purchase David's book, Black and British, A Forgotten History, or Susan's book, Learning from the Germans, Confronting Race and the Memory of Evil, you can see them on the book tab on the right hand side of your screen and just click through to Waterstones. Please do sign up to our mailing list on our website, intelligencesquared.com. That's where you'll find out about all of our upcoming events. We can send you emails, let you know what's coming up. And do consider becoming a member of the Intelligence Squared Plus community with the special discount codes that I mentioned earlier, monthly or annual, depending on which one you'd like to subscribe to. You'll get 20% off and the first month free if you register by next Friday. We look forward to seeing you at another event very soon. And once again, I'm delighted to say we had over 1,700 people in the audience tonight. So thank you for joining us. From all of us at Intelligence Squared,